I don't think we can imagine ourselves living without our mobile phones. They have become such a part of necessity that living without them seems to be something difficult to get rid of now. Though there is one thing about these phones, there is so much horror that these little devices can carry around. Horrors that we will not have any idea that they exist. Mobiles were something that I never thought would be harmless in any way. But the little device was like a little devil to me. Completely shattered my life and turned it upside down. It was a disaster in a small device. Who thought that it would be the cause of such distress to me? I had my doubts about the mobile from the moment I bought one. I wasn't really planning on getting a mobile phone, but I was moving out of the house and to college and was to live in the dorm for the duration of my time in college, so I had to buy the phone in order to keep in touch with my family and friends. I was not getting the hang of the phone, but the sake of keeping up with everything I had to work with it. I was in the first year of my college, and it was then that I got my first mobile phone. I wasn't one of those people who just lived around the phones, so I just barely cared about it. And one morning, when I was returning from my class, somebody stole the phone. I was reckless before, and with the phone around, it was meant to happen one day. There was no surprise there. For the sake of looking for it, I went all the way back to the campus trying to retrace my steps and find the damn thing. But I don't think I was getting any luck. And even then, I wasn't really looking the way someone with a lost phone would actually look if they cared about it. I didn't really care much about the lost phone and just kept on being me and stayed without a phone for a while. And then two days after my phone was lost, I decided to file in a report of the missing phone. I had no idea where my phone was, and I wasn't really interested in finding out where the phone was. When I wasn't able to locate my phone, I just gave up on the search for it. I was also not interested in buying a new one, and when I thought I got rid of the phone for good, then three days later, police barged into my dorm arresting me. I was clueless. I had no idea why I was being arrested. They gave me no reason. I was not sure why I was being arrested. I was sitting ducks waiting for the detectives to come in, and then he came in and started, Do you know why you've been arrested today? And I replied, I have no idea. And they said, Your phone has been collected from a place of a crime. We checked the phone. It's yours. We saw it. And I told them everything, and how I don't know how, and when the phone got to the place it was in right now. They had detained me, and were even threatening a long time in jail if things aren't figured out very easily. So I decided to fully cooperate and tell them everything I knew, and other than losing my phone, there wasn't much to tell anyways. The police pulled in the photographs of the report and told me that my phone was found on the body of one Rebecca, and she was molested, and everything was recorded on my phone and then uploaded on my social media. I explained to them, and they were not ready to listen to me. Now, this was very troublesome, and I understood how difficult it could it be for the officers to actually believe that maybe I'm not the one to do such thing, knowing that everything was posted on my social media. All I had to do was prove them that I wasn't the murderer, and by the time I could do it, the word was already getting out and being not so social. People just stereotyped me to be the kind of person that would do such a thing. On one occasion, some of my classmates even testified against me when the police asked, saying that I was a creep and there was no doubt that I might have done that deed. It was hard to convince anyone of my innocence, and to do that to police would take a really much more than it would to do it for a civilian. But the police was not ready to listen, and they were trying to get a confession out of me, but I wasn't giving them. I cannot give them something that is not true. So I decided to plead my own case, but I was being held back at the station and there was not much I could do via action. So I really put my mind into it and focused. And then I realized that the last place that I left my phone at was the library. And it must have lost somewhere in the library because I remember it was the last place that I took my phone and put it aside on the table and forgot. And it struck me that I was right at the position of the library camera. So if the camera was catching things, it meant that I would be there losing my phone too. I told the police about this lead and told them to go on and get on with it. And then after a lot of persuasion and pleading, they finally decided to look into it. After holding me in my cell for two days, the officer that arrested me came outside my cell and said, Kid, you used your cards right. You are free to go now. 
Good for you on thinking on your feet. And I asked the officer who did that, and they told me that it was an old lover and he used my phone to get back at her. The guy single-handedly almost ruined my life. He ruined the life of that girl and himself. I was lucky enough to get out and be free because I have seen the cases where people have been wrongfully accused of the cases. Thank God I am not that cautionary tale. And moreover, I am done with mobile phones. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. This story occurred during the 2017 Christmas holiday. I was living in a city about 700 miles away from where I grew up. Every year for the last five, I'd return to my parents' home to celebrate the holidays with them. This year would be no different. My job at the time was to provide customer service for a global computer software company based in my state. Five days a week, I spoke to customers, some furious and some clueless. The call that spawned this mess started like almost any other. The gentleman on the phone had a few questions regarding his warranty. I answered them as well as I could. Once or twice, there was a brief gap in the call as I waited for the computer to give me the information I needed. As you do during periods of silence, the caller began making small talk. I joined in, not thinking anything bad would become that. Over the course of the discussion, he made note of my accent and asked what state I was from. I answered, and it turned out that he lived in that state. Before I knew it, we were discussing our hometowns, and he turned out to live just a town over from the one I grew up in. The entire conversation seemed innocent. When he asked if I ever went back home, I said I did ever Christmas. Nothing more was said after that. He thanked me for my help and hung up. The call was so ordinary that I'd forgotten about it by the end of my shift. A few weeks would pass, and I would take a flight back home to celebrate with my parents. The scary part of the story begins here. It was December 23rd, and I was helping my folks put up the tree doorbell rang, and when I opened the door, a man had been recognized on the porch. I kindly asked him if I could help. He looked at me puzzled and said something like, Mike, come on, it's Daryl. These are not her actual names, of course. When I talked to you on the phone, we made plans to hang out. Honestly, I had no idea what this man was talking about. He reminded me, and the discussion slowly came back to me. I did remember some vague talk about us possibly getting together, but no vital information had been shared. I was trying to be nice with you to do strangers with common connections and never had any intention of meeting the guy. Most men understand this silly game, but he obviously didn't. He had me backed into a corner and I didn't want to be rude, so I made up a story about being needed around the house. This wasn't a complete lie. I suggested we could possibly meet up the next day and ask for his phone number. The answer seemed to please him and he laughed. I am ashamed to admit it took me a few hours for the oddity of the situation to hit me. First and foremost, how in God's name did he get my parents' address? I knew for a fact I never gave it to him. I'm still not sure how he got my last name. The creepiness of the situation made me shiver. Now I found myself at a crossroad. Did I call him and ask how he found me? Or do I just ghost him and hope I didn't hear from him again? After a long night of tossing and turning, I chose the latter. Call me worse all you want, but I very much dislike confrontations. This path just sounded easier to me, and it's too bad, and it didn't work. Christmas Eve arrived, and I planned to spend it with my extended family. Things went well, until my phone began to ring around 10.30 that evening. No one I knew would call me that late, so I thought answered with a bit of curt tone in my voice and Darrow came at me with an attitude from the start. I'm the one that should be mad. We were supposed to go out tonight and you bailed on me. His tone set me off. I told him I never promised him anything and he shouldn't assume someone would be free to drop everything on Christmas to meet up with a stranger. He began to talk, but I cut him off. I continued by asking how I got my personal information and told him I didn't appreciate him showing up unannounced. Uh, you told me your last name when we talked about hanging out. Don't you remember? I just looked up your parents' address in the phone book. I was at a loss for words. I still insist I never gave my last name, but somehow he got it. 
Him saying I did name even matter. There was no way I was going to let this dude gaslight me. I'd have enough of his games, and as calmly as possible, I told him to never contact me again and hung up. As far as I was concerned, it was over. Only after I calmed down that I began to wonder how he got my cell number. And this made me furious. So furious, I threw my phone against the wall as hard as I could in fury. And now that I think about it, it was probably the right idea. Christmas Day was spent with my parents and went by quite except for one creepy interruption. I'm not sure Daryl was involved, but it's highly likely. In the time we were sitting down for dinner, my parents' home phone rang. My mom answered it and said hello a number of times, but the caller didn't speak. My mom, being busy, shrugged her shoulders and hung up. My guard was up and considered the recent events. I figured it was Daryl trying to intimidate my family. Fortunately, I kept my family out of the business and they thought nothing of it. The subsequent incidents I was expecting never came, and the remainder of my time there went by smoothly. My last encounter with Dara was probably the creepiest of them all. The morning of the 27th was my final day in town. I was scheduled for an 11 a.m. flight. My dad and I were heading out at around 8, and I was standing next to the car to giving my mom one last hug. I happened to glance over my shoulder and caught sight of someone standing behind a tree. They were about 50 yards away, but I could tell it was Daryl. It shocked me, but I was able to hide it from my parents. I insisted my dad we needed to go. There was no way for me to know what he had planned, but I had a hunch my presence was keeping him there as we passed him a step behind the tree, but the tree was too small to conceal him, and our eyes met one another's, and I could see the hate seething from him. It was honestly one of the most surreal experiences of my entire life. My dad noticed at that point and made a comment about how lonely a crazy person would be out on 27 degree morning, and he had no idea how right he was. The flight home went out without a hitch. I was relieved to be back to somewhere I felt safe. The possibility of Daryl doing something to my parents stayed with me for several months, but things turned out to be just as I thought. I must have been the sole focus of his obsession or whatever you want to call it. There was always the worry that he'd show up in my apartment, but that never materialized. Thank God. Work was awkward. With every call I expected to hear at Daryl on the other end, that too never occurred. And now that I'm working and living elsewhere, I'm not as worried. Nonetheless, I'm always aware of my surroundings. You can never be sure when your enemy may decide the time is right to pounce. It may all be a product of an overactive imagination, but I'd rather be safe and sorry. After all, I've got a family to worry about now. Reading and listening to these stories has brought up an old memory that I thought might be interesting to share. It was happening when I was 15 years old. I would like to say I'm a female and definitely did not look older than my age. In fact, most people thought I was younger. I had just moved about four hours away from another state and one of my friends from my old school was visiting for the week. We decided to start this trip by shopping in a large mall close to my new house. Thanks to me being an avid Pinterest user at the time and us being teenagers that wanted to look cute, we decided to dress nice just for fun. I was wearing a somewhat short skirt and knee-high socks. Yes, I know, that sounds somewhat like a stripper, but it was all the rage on the fashion side of Pinterest at the time. My friends, who are referred to as Haley, was also wearing a skirt. My mother and younger sister was also in the mall. but. We have gone our separate ways. As like most teenagers, we wanted to be independent. We started a shopping at the store Pink, which if you don't already know is a branch off of Victoria's Secret, but for teenagers rather than adults. The store only sells clothes for girls focusing on teens. I've always been paranoid and the type of person that is always scanning the people around me just because I like to be aware. When we enter the store, I instantly noticed a man who looked to be in his mid-30s to 40s. He stood still, not shopping around, and he looked nervous. You could see that he was sweating. My first thought was that he was a father to some teenage grown 
was maybe uncomfortable with the type of clothing the store sells. Either way, he made me uncomfortable. So I moved to the other side of the store, and Haley followed. As I was shopping around, I turned to my left and saw the same man. And we this time, he was looking at a pink hoodie as if shopping. Red flags instantly popped up. The man had not been shopping around before, and now I was looking at hoodies made for teenage girls. I couldn't say for sure if he had followed us, but something that my god said he did, and that I needed to get away without saying anything to Haley. I simply walked out the store and right into the store next door. Haley was obviously confused and asked me what was up. I told her I thought a man had followed us around the store and I wanted to get out. She told me I was being dramatic and it was probably just a coincidence. Almost as if on cue, right then, the same man in the store we were in started to look at female shoes. I pointed them out and told her that was the man and as soon as he noticed that we had seen him, he left the store. Haley took me more seriously now, but still didn't really believe he was following us. I, on the other hand, was already freaking out. Abercrombie was right across the mall, maybe 40 feet from the store we were currently in. Haley said we should walk into Abercrombie so that if he follows us inside, we know for sure that he's following us. Scared out of my mind to leave our little store, we quickly fast walked into Abercrombie. Once inside, we walked a little into the store so it wasn't so obvious and waited. We then saw the man casually walking around the mall making a big loop, I'm assuming to not be so obvious, and headed right for us. At that point, even Haley started to panic. We started to walk further into the store while discussing our options. It's crazy how alone you can feel during situations like this even when you're surrounded by people. Haley wanted to go somewhere like a dressing room to hide from him, but I didn't want to be anywhere out of the public eye. When we decided to go to the back of the store where the checkout area was, until one of the employees, if you've ever been inside of Abercrombie, it split into two sides, the male side and female side with the registers in the back. As we moved, we saw the man clearly start walking into the female side of the store, confirming even more that this simply wasn't shopping around. Both Haley and I were shaking at this point while rushing to the back. We ran up the first male employee we saw and told him that there was a man following us. He started to ask us a question. I can't remember what anymore, and right when we saw the creep turn the corner into the area that we were in, we quickly pointed him out to the Abercrombie worker, and as soon as he saw we were talking to someone, he took off. The employee happened to actually be the manager and was completely shocked when we told him what had happened. He walked us up to the front of the store and we looked for him, but we didn't see him. He told us to walk around for a minute and come back while he wants to see if the man is still around. Thankfully, the creep didn't come back. Apparently, deciding dealing with the manager was too much work. We eventually went on our way and tried to enjoy the rest of the day. But I was scared the whole time and really just wanted to go home. I called my mom after the whole ordeal and told her what had happened. And at the end of our shopping trip, she took us back to Abercrombie to thank the man who helped us. The story seemed like he was a perfect happy ending. But that's just not how this world works. While talking to the manager inside Abercrombie, we noticed someone walking around the mall in a familiar hoodie. That's right. The same man was walking around casually holding a drink in his hand, looking like a normal guy. We all watched in horror from the store window as the man turned to walk back into the store pink again. I don't know what happened after this. I believe they called mall security on the man, but I'm not sure what followed after that. I'm still so grateful for my paranoid self noticing him as soon as I did, and for the amazing manager at Abercrombie for saving us.